Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here with the PMQ EVO at World Time Attack 2015. Now the PMQ EVO is running in the Pro-Am class and last year made some really big waves by setting the third outright fastest time. So it's definitely a major contender. I've got Mark McCoy here from Motec Australia and I wanted to chat to you Mark about uh, one of the innovations on this car which is the, the paddle shift gearbox. But before we get into that it's running a full suite of uh, Motec electronics. Can you talk us through each of those, those components? What's it running for engine management for a start? Well basically it's got our new M150 ECU which is uh, currently like the, the replacement for our older 100 series. So basically all of our development's going into them at the moment. So it's a similar thing, basically the same ECUs you'd run on a V8 supercar. Uh, we're using them in the R35 GTR package and also the FT86 package has the same ECU. So this, this one has the same ECU hardware, just slightly different uh, software package to suit what they're doing in this car. Now in terms of that software package, other than the, the gear change or the, the paddle shift which I want to talk about separately, is there anything other, speci other special features in this package to suit the style of time attack racing? Um, not really, I mean it, it's our, it, you can think of the engine management side of it as the GPR package which is again the same as like the FT86 and, and the, the GPR package is what we're basing everything around so that like for people like you and me we've got like a, a common base for our, the way we do our fuel and the way we do our ignition. Um, I mean it's got full closed loop boost control with, you know, you can change that based on gear and speed and like knobs on the dash and all those kind of things. So um, something specific for time attack, I don't really think it's super necessary um, because most of our stuff obviously is based with a, a circuit racing background anyway. So it's all, it's all pretty much there now anyway. Yep. Uh, that, that covers the actual engine management side. Uh, you've also got a, a PDM and a C125 dash I think it is, isn't it? Can you talk us through those products? Yeah, we've got a PDM in there, so obviously the power distribution module. So the basic idea of a PDM is obviously to get rid of all your fuses and relays and have something that's in solid state electronics. Now the biggest benefit of that is we can actually program when things come on and off. And if you think about, uh, I don't know, like a failure mode where maybe the alternators died and you're running out of juice. So what you could do is start turning off uh, things like, I don't know, unnecessary things like maybe the, the, the wipers or uh, some of the other functions, maybe the driver driver aids which might not annoy them a little bit but at least the car keeps going so you can have a hierarchy of what you want on and what you want off uh, the other good thing is if you blow a fuse fuse is blown you've actually got to pull something out and put it back in at least in this it can wait for the thing to oh, let's say cool down and give it another try uh, we basically have things where you can uh, set up if something's fail like maybe a fuel pumps starting to drag a bit too much current you can actually have it turn off and then turn back on turn off, turn back on, so you can at least get the thing back to the pit so the guys can have a bit of a look and maybe change out a pump. We've had numerous people uh, um, have been really glad about those features because they don't leave you stuck out the back of the, the, the track, you can actually limp the car back and get things sorted in the pits. Now you're definitely a, a lot smarter than uh, the old traditional fuse, you don't have to pull over to the side of the track and physically replace a fuse. Now I know uh, something that I've, I've found really useful with the PDM product is the ability also to data log currents and loads on any of the channels, uh, that, uh, that can make uh, fault finding exactly what has gone wrong a lot faster because you know exactly where to look, would that be fair? Absolutely, like especially like the fuel pump is a pretty good example because I mean without the fuel pump car didn't go. So and you know, you know from personal experience of not putting filters in and filters getting blocked and things like that. So if you've got guys who are looking at the data and keeping an eye on things like the actual current draw of that device, um, data logging is effectively a history. If you notice a change then you've got to explain the change. So whether it's actually failed or not, if you start noticing that that starts creeping up to something it hasn't before, well then you can preempt the fact that you're going to have a problem and maybe sort that out like before it even becomes any kind of issue on the track. Now we've talked a little bit about data logging already and it's got the uh, MoTeC full colour dash in there uh, as a driver display. You've obviously got the ability there to, to log in, in multiple places through the ECU and through the dash. How are you dealing with that? Where is, is there a central place for the data logging? It's a bit of a, like, I could probably just stick with um, P 
personal opinion here. Like the good thing is we've got uh, like Anton here doing the the chassis stuff, and they've got another engineer, and they can look after that. I'm realistically just looking after the gearbox. So I kind of prefer myself to like if you've got like an ECU that's like as sophisticated as like an M150. All the mission critical stuff to the M150, like the gearbox, injectors, lambda, and all those kind of things. If I can grab it straight from the ECU at like nice high rates, um, you know that works for me. Um, realistically, most of the ECU data is also going up to the dashboard, so the engineers have everything. So they've got one central place. So for their job, if they're looking at say dampers or something like that, and they suddenly want to know what the engine was doing in a corner or something, they've still got that all as well. It really. It's really up to the team. Um, I know I, how I prefer to do it. Um, having one log file with everything in for historic purposes is a much better idea. So that would be ECU canning it up to the, the dashboard, log it all in the dashboard. So, so there's no strictly one right, right or wrong way of doing it. It, it comes down a little bit to, to personal preference. Uh, let, let's move on though and talk a little bit about this gearbox, which is, as I said, one of the, the main innovations with the car. And we have seen uh, obviously sequential gearboxes and nothing new. And we've seen cars with sequential gearboxes and strain gauge gear levers where the ECU could already do uh, upshift uh, ignition cut and downshift throttle blip. Now the pedal shift takes that one step further and removes the the gear lever altogether. Can you start by talking us through the hardware required to actually convert the gearbox to pedal shift? Well basically most of the gearbox manufacturers these days do take this into account and uh, from a hardware perspective it is quite simple because uh, most of the uh, paddle shift type of guys will supply a device which more or less you unbolt the gear lever put that on the shelf and put in like a pneumatic actuator. So from a gearbox point of view, there's no, you don't have to go sell like your expensive gearbox and get a complete new one. So you can actually replace the parts with uh, paddle shift specific parts. And then after that, it's realistically, uh, most of the systems are pneumatic. So we'd have a, a pump and an accumulator. So obviously they're fairly separate to the gearbox. And then set of nice paddles on the steering wheel and a bit of wiring into the ECU and let the ECU take care of it all. So, so from that ECU perspective, uh, what is the ECU doing to make all, make all of this work seamlessly for the driver? <laughs> um, it does sound like a reasonably simple job of more or less replacing like the backwards and forwards, but um, the things that people sort of don't really consider until they've actually driven something with a sequential dog box is, is how, how smooth you need to be with things like throttle application and maybe how you lift and then when you're getting back on the throttle of, the, the gear change ignition cut and how that needs to phase in and out. Um, there's actually quite a lot of little bits and pieces that um, you now can rely on the ECU to do. So like an upshift is, is a relatively simple thing. We simply just cut uh, torque to the engine. Um, the, there's sort of a, like a timing system which sort of more or less preloads the gearbox, gets the gearbox ready to, um, to shift and once it's in that state then cuts the engine so realistically that should happen really fast and it's all timed perfectly then once it actually gets to the next gear then we reintroduce the power and we can do that over a fairly long time or over a really short time uh, I'll, just, I'll just stop you there with the, the, the term you just used was uh, reduce the engine torque or cut the torque and uh, just to explain that a little bit further you've got the option to reduce that engine torque to allow the shift to occur using either ignition cutting or fuel cutting uh, you can do a combination of both, uh, one or the other, or actually just leave it completely to ignition timing. So not stopping the cylinder firing, you're actually just retarding the, the, the um, ignition timing a long way after top dead centre. So effectively still fires the cylinder, but it fires it so far past top dead centre it doesn't make any torque. And all you're really trying to do is reduce torque. So um, depending on the people you talk to, and it can really depend on engine and, and it can come down to gearbox as well, like the design of the gearbox, but um, generally tend to find that uh, at the beginning we'll, we'll cut the ignition um, just so that simply stops the cylinder firing, so therefore no torque for that cycle. And then uh, it's really a matter of um, the gearbox having uh, reduced enough torque so the uh, air actuator can actually pull it out of gear. And once you got to that point, because all of that's sort of like a closed loop system, the ECU knows that, yeah, it's shifted, and once it's uh, waited long enough for it to actually get into the next gear, then it simply reinstates all that torque. 
so so that that's uh, being a closed loop system. You're not actually cutting that ignition or cutting or reducing that torque for a fixed amount of time. It is physically looking at when the the next gear is also engaged, and that's better for the gearbox reliability as well. Um, it makes a big difference to how fast the car feels to the driver. Like uh, the drivers will generally feel like a change of 10 to 20 milliseconds of timing. So what we actually do is we uh, specify with a barrel position sensor. They've got like an analog sensor, a bit like a, a throttle position sensor on the gearbox. So we actually set a tolerance. So once you're at X voltage, that is the next gear. So the ECU recognises that and goes, OK, I don't need to be cutting the engine anymore. I can reinstate the torque. So it's what we call a closed loop system. It'll cut for as long as it needs to get to the next gear. OK, and we generally keep those times uh, really short anyway. Um, so you're looking at actually moving a gearbox from one gear to the next in probably 40 or 50, 60 milliseconds, that type of thing. Could you give that give us some indication of how that would compare to a manually actuated shift with a sequential gearbox? Can be a little bit difficult. You, a driver can actually shift the gear quite quickly. But if you think back to the old days before gear change ignition cut, where the driver actually had to lift his foot off the throttle and then put it back on, while the driver f thinks in their head that they're doing that pretty quickly, realistically, you're up around like the 200 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds. I talk in milliseconds which sounds like a, a really small amount of time but when you're on the track and you've got to do 16 gear shifts in a lap you think save 100 milliseconds on each of them times 16 you know like you're talking up in the seconds one one and a half seconds type of thing so I mean you know every tiny little bit helps and it's repeatable that's the main thing the ECU will always do the same thing if you ever looked at like uh, data logging from a driver who's completely in control, not to offend anyone here, but realistically, um, as much as you get like the good drivers and the top level drivers and stuff, they're not as consistent as a computer. And the thing you can always rely on is the computer will be consistent. It will do the same thing each time. Plus the whole closed loop part, if the driver um, or something's happening in the gearbox, the ECU will wait for the gearbox to catch up before it does anything. So it's not going to reintroduce torque when it's part way through a shift and potentially result in damaging the gears or the, the dogs at least. That's the basic idea. Obviously the person with the laptop ultimately decides how good this thing is but uh, effectively what we would do is we would set uh, a maximum time we would think that a shift should have taken place in. Uh, usually about two 250 milliseconds but you'll always find that even a driver will get there quicker so the ECU will chop that back to once I'm in the next gear then it will chop it off so let, let's say a round figure about 60 milliseconds for a shift. Now we've talked about the upshifts the, the downshift with these paddle shift boxes are, is a little bit more complex than a, a sequential and uh, can you talk us through that because obviously now we have to blip the throttle to, to help uh, unload the gearbox and allow the shift to occur? Yes, um, actually down changing is a, is a much, much harder proposition than upshifting because uh, on an upshift you're usually like at full throttle and you're going in a straight line and you, you don't mind a little bit of upset in the car. Uh, on a down change, um, especially when you're braking and you, the car might be a little bit unstable, like making sure you match the revs into the next gear down is, is, is it's critical to the feel, uh, especially some of the guys here actually downshifting in a corner so you don't want to nip up the back tyres on a rear wheel drive car and, and have it sort of slew sideways. So what we do is we, we pay very careful attention to the actual gear ratios in the gearbox. So what the ECU will constantly be doing is it'll be saying, OK, I'm at X RPM, but if I was to go to the next gear down, the RPM will be X. So what we do is as soon as you uh, ask for a shift, we'll get the gearbox ready with a bit of preload on the actuator, and then we'll actually blip the throttle. Uh, but what we can actually do is we can give it a really big blip to get our response, and then the RPM limiter is actually set down to what it should be in the next gear. So then the revs come up to where it needs to be perfectly slotted in that gear. So it makes a big difference to the feel of the of the, the down changes and it doesn't upset the car. So you, using that rev limiter at the RPM that the car will be in in the next lowest gear means there's absolutely no no chance of the, the throttle blip being too aggressive over revving and then the, the, the back end of the car or the drive wheels locking up on that gear shift? Uh, that's correct. I mean, that's the idea. There is a uh, reasonable amount of tuning in there because each each gearbox has its little own in idiosyncrasies with uh, dog tooth shape, uh, the weight of bits floating around in the gearbox, and things like that. So you do actually have a 
have to tweak a little bit, but I mean, that's what the tuning software is, is for. And we give you plenty of uh, little tables and uh, stuff to, to get it just right for your gearbox. So I've noticed uh, with the three cars I'm doing here today, like each one of them, even uh, two similar gearboxes between the PMQ car and one of the other Evos, just like little idiosyncrasies of the maybe the drivetrain or the car or the response of the engine. Uh, so I actually changed the tuning slightly on the down change to make a difference there. Some of the guys just think I'd just put some figures in and they just loved it. Because I mean, um, one of the big things I found uh, with my limited experience driving is if you can take away having to blip the throttle when you're in a braking zone, like it just gives your brain a bit more time to concentrate on other things, at least for myself, that like make up for the other comment about that. I think another aspect of that as well is pretty well documented that even uh, professional drivers, when you're manually blipping the throttle on a downshift, there's a natural tendency to reduce the braking effort during that throttle blip. So if you don't need to worry about that, you can concentrate solely on the job of braking, you're going to be able to produce maximum braking efforts, that fair? Absolutely, like you always see in uh, data logging, if you've got brake pressure and like a manually blipped throttle, you'll always sort of see that it's very, very hard for the driver to use his uh, right foot to hold constant brake pressure and also move it to blip the throttle. So yeah, it takes all of that out of it. So even with the uh, manually shifted stuff now, we've been uh, blipping the throttle and rev matching uh, exactly the same system, but, but a manually shifted thing. And it makes so much difference to, and that's the, the benefit of drive-by-wire, like simple as that. All right, look, uh, thanks for giving us some insight into how, how that system works. It's certainly a, an interesting technology, and I, I guess over time, uh, as it becomes slightly more affordable with these gearboxes and the systems, we're going to see it trickle down into more and more motorsports. So thanks for letting us know how that all works, and good luck for the rest of your weekend. Not a problem. See ya. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.